Good day. Uh, today I have the pleasure of interviewing uh, Wayne Stevenson up north of me in England. Uh, we're both experiencing the same weather today, which is not too bad. What's it like up where you are, Wayne? Typical Scottish weather. Miserable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been very, very um, up and down, hasn't it? Um, yeah. Wayne, it's good to have you on board. Um, uh, your story is going to be another thread in the tapestry of our history. And um, looking at your synopsis, it covers quite... Um, a large period of time from the 60s right up to uh, 1981. Uh, some interesting looking topics there. So I think we'll start from the beginning and um, just uh, give us a background of who you are, where you are, and how you ended up in the army. Well, I was brought up in uh, Bulawayo. Um, I started my schooling at uh, Coglin, which I know is a, a, a girls' school, but uh, we did our KGs there. Um, spent a short time at Fort Vic. And then uh, back to Bulawayo, where I went to Milton Junior, um, and then off to boarding school, um, St. Thomas Aquinas in Bulawayo, which was run by the Catholic Dominican nuns, um, terrors they were. Um, and then from there, I uh, went to board with my grandparents in Southtown, uh, which is in north, north of Bulawayo. And um, I then went on to uh, North Street to do my high, my high schooling. Um, during the time that I was uh, at um, at boarding school, I, I spent a lot of time, uh, all my school holidays and that, with uh, uh, my aunt and uncle who initially had a ranch, a family ranch down at um, Marula Way, uh, Varshu Ranch. And um, they then moved from there to um, Liebig's Ranch, which is down in the southwest near West Nicholson. Um, my uncle wasn't a cattle farmer, he was actually ran the, the native trading stores there, but I spent all my, my youth uh, there, spent a lot of time in the bush, um, hunting and the usual things that boys get up to, you know. From, from when I went to, uh, to North Lee, my first sort of introduction to the military was uh, at cadets, where uh, every Thursday one had to do um, cadets. And it got me kind of interested into, perhaps I had a friend who joined the RLI and, he, he tried to convince me to join, and uh, my uncle said, no way. He said, if you join the army, you join the SAS. Yeah. But um, it was in the federal days, so the SAS were actually based up in up in northern Rhodesia, as it was. Um, and I, uh, I kind of let it fall by the way. And, of course, when you turn 16, you get a registration number, and off you go to uh, to the army. So I, I did my four and a half months um, in the federal army, um, historically, we were the, the last, we were in A Company, Intake 61, and we were the last company to fall out, pass out, sorry, um, in December of that of that year. Um, the Federation, of course, broke up uh, at, the, at the end of the, at the end of that year. Some of the training we actually got uh, in the four and a half months, which I thought was, was very useful, was we, towards the end of our uh, four and a half months, we spent a, a time in, uh, they had a, a training ground in the Metopus, and uh, where the SAS did their training initially. And um, we spent like 10 days and we were acting as the insurgents and um, chasing them around and uh, we did anti-tracking. It was the first time I ever come into anything like that. And we had a staff officer with us who, who showed us the ropes, And uh, but it's quite easy to anti-track in, in, in Metopus because there's a lot of, lot of rock there, so it's easy to cover one's, one's trail. Were, were the um, uniforms back in those days, were they camouflaged, Wayne, or were they still the khaki drill? No, we had we had all the khaki drill, uh, nothing camouflaged. Um, the bane of our lives there was that we, you know, the webbing, uh, our, our webbing and, and packs were actually blankoed. Um, and that was a, a bloody swine, you know, because you had to, to blanko um, all, your, uh, all your kit. And... Uh, Every time you went out to the range or something, you know, we got dirty. So every night it was, you basically had to wash off the blanket and re blanket the thing. Yeah, so, um, I mean, we even had, I mean, even like in, when I went to Second Battalion, we had the first field dressings, you know, marked 1942, 43, you know. So we still had a lot of that, uh, I think it's called the 38 pattern of webbing. Um, and even that into, um, into when I went into the Territorial Battalion then. Um, at the end, obviously at the end of Federation, um, I'll just talk a little bit about the battalions. Um, there were initially 15 battalions 
in the Rhodesian army, but five of those were actually cadets, which fell by the way in 1966. But um, the third and seventh battalions were actually based in northern Rhodesia. Yeah. So at the, end, at the end of Federation, they fell away. They were incorporated into the Zambian army. Um, so we had, uh, like in Bulawayo, um, I was posted to the second battalion. Um, so in Bulawayo, you had the, the second, sixth, and ninth. In Guelo, you had the tenth. Um, in Salisbury, was first, fifth, and eighth. And Mtali was the fourth. Um, what a lot of people don't um, remember or recall is that uh, the active battalions in the in the towns, namely our, the second battalion, we were on standby 24/7 um, for four years. You had to complete four years of of uh, what they call effective uh, um, efficient years, um, and that every Thursday was a, a parade day. One had to go in full uniform, um, and the parades consisted of you know, usually the roll call and so on, and you were only docked with one hour for that. Uh, and to get an efficient year, we had to do 40 hours minimum. Oh. Um, it doesn't sound a lot, but it's, yeah. it's like 40 weeks, you know? Mm, yeah. um, and, that, and that was, uh, there wasn't a lot going on in those days. Um, it was mainly square bashing and then it was getting dark when I went to the lecture rooms and uh, lectured on voice procedure and that sort of thing, or end up in the army cleaning, cleaning weapons. But in, and, and what weapons were you using? Was it the Sten gun or the um, 303? No, we, no, no. We had uh, uh, when we did when we did cadets. In fact, we were issued with uh, the 303, and we had to do. Uh, it was just then that the army had been issued with the SLR, the self-loading rifle, which is the, yeah. the British equivalent of the, of the FN. Yeah, they brought that out, and, and we were issued with those. They were wooden butts, uh, but. As I say, in the cadets, it was difficult because we had to learn the. there's no pistol grip on the 303. So we had to use your middle finger in the trigger guard, you know, at the at the shoulder arms. So, um, but we did OK because, we, I mean, we, we did disgrace ourselves at the Queen's Birthday Parade as a school company, you know. Um, yeah, so we had we had um, um, FNs. Um, we still had Bryn guns, but they were, they were phased out and, uh, and then we got the MAGs. Um, and I think the SLRs were still single shot at that point in time, weren't they? Were they? No, they, no, they weren't. They were uh, well, yeah, they weren't. Um, um, and they did, we didn't use them on automatic at all. It was, mm. you know, the was self loading. Yeah, um, and we did so in 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 sixty four. Any sort of of interest in sixty four? Um, Ian Smith called up uh, an Indaba um, in uh, I think it was in Goromonzi where he got all the chiefs from around the country uh, assembled in, and had a, a great big meeting with them to find out what their political views were. And, and we were tasked with going out and we were dropped off in twos and threes in various villages because they thought the agitators would get in and um, cause a bit of nonsense, you know. So that was, that was basically uh, uh, about, a, that was about just over a week that we were there. Um, and then... Uh, and I was transferred uh, by my company to, to Salisbury and I was posted to the 1st Battalion. Um, but I was posted to what, what is, was known as OPA, Out of Prescribed Areas, that it stood for. And the, the idea of that was um, farmers, miners, foresters and, um, and the like people like you who worked outside the country. Uh, we're not, we're, I mean, a farmer to come from all the way from Karoi down to Salisbury for a one-hour meeting. I mean, it was crazy. It took him three hours to get there, you know. Yeah. So, the, so the, I think the I think the the hindquarters got together with the police and decided that they need to these these were trained soldiers and they weren't doing any commitment military commitment, and that that was kind of the start of part two, the police anti-terrorist unit. Um, but we were still, as I say, initially um, it was just uh, that was like the first phase going through. We were basically stagnant, if want of a better word, until one day, um, I think it was in in August, August 67, I got a phone call to say that I was to report immediately to to uh, the drill hall in Salisbury, which I did and got up on my kit, got there, signed in, was told to go and get weapon, ammunition, rat packs. No one told us what we were there for, but uh, um, anyway, we had to sleep overnight and then the next morning they said trucks will be coming to fetch you, six o'clock, jump on the trucks. And we headed off and I, I 
because I'd been in Salisbury for a short while. I knew we were heading, heading for the airport. And it was when we got to New Serum, there were three uh, Dakotas parked on the uh, on the runway. And uh, we, had to, we were told to get onto the planes. And this, of course, uh, there was everyone looking at each other, thinking, God, where are we going? <laughs> you know, we must be going on an external or something, you know, to Nias land or whatever. Anyway, it, it turned out we, we uh, some officer there told us we were going to Heaney. And of course, Heaney, um, Heaney was, we, we know it as Llewellyn Barracks, but in the days of the Second World War, it was um, a training training camp for uh, for pilots and the, oh. and the like, you know. Yeah. And it was named after the railway junction there, which was Heaney Junction. Um, so they refueled there and we got back on the plane and we were told, oh, we're going off to Wanky. Um, and I told the guys, I said, there's no runway at Wanky, you must be going to Wanky National Park, where I'd, I'd been there before. And I think that that strip was actually built by the South African government because they had um, revetments there and, and the like. Anyway, we landed there and um, deplaned, and uh, there was sort of an officer standing, one, only one chap there. And I recognized him as uh, a friend of mine and, and a second battalion uh, officer, was Vic Thackeray. Vic, Vic Thackeray. And people will know Vic from. Uh, the, the regular army guys would, yeah. but Vic then was a, a captain in in Tubat, and I spoke to him and um, we had a long chat. He told me he was going to join the army as a regular, and he said to me, "Look, get, uh, he knew I was a driver. You see, so he said, I'm in the jump in. Let's get going. We've got to go to um, Jambizi. Now you know Jambizi. I think you've you've been there. Yes, very much so. And in our day, it was just a an, um, internal affairs had a, a rest camp there. I think it was. That was about it, um, and of course you know that that um, that part of the world that uh, Kalahari Sandfelt, not good for. We we had we had uh, the second battalion vehicles we had. They were they were Thames traders, no four wheel drive. Oh my so God. we were stuck in the sand and yeah. out pushing, pushing, and eventually Vic said, "Look, guys, we've got to, I've got to deploy you." So we stopped where we were stuck, and um, in those days we were in six or five, um, and. So he got, he got hold of a sergeant and and four others. That was our stick, and we were told to march from A to B. And he, t he told me on the way down in the track that um, there was a massive incursion, uh, probably up to 100 insurgents coming from from Zambia, and that uh, we must we on uh, that's that's our task to go and see if we can pick up tracks and find these guys. So we we went basically from the dire due east, um, looking for these tracks. And, and Vic said, look, you won't find 100 of these guys, but they're, they've probably split up into groups of 10 or maybe 15 sort of thing. Um, unfortunately, the, 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 the soldier that we had with us, he, he was still old school and marched on the compass, you know. So everything that was in front of the compass, we had to climb over. So, uh, you know, eventually okay. I said to the guy, I said, you know, we're not going to make off, off point, point B, you know. And he said, no, that was, he was tossed with that, and that's where we're going. And it was up this very great big gormo. And I said, ah, uh -uh. I said, if we're looking for these insurgents, they're not going to climb up, up mountains. So they take the easiest route around. Absolutely. They'll, follow, they'll either go down a, a dry riverbed or along the mm. river, uh, river line, but uh, not over mountains. And mm. anyway, he, he wasn't, that, wasn't happy. But eventually on day two, he got the message. And we then went around. We still went due east, but round and round the, the mountain sort of thing. And um, anyway, we ended up at the at, at the Kwai River uh, Bridge, you know, the, on the road to Kamatibi. We ended up there, and they we radioed in, and vehicles came, picked us up, took us back to Bulawayo, onto the train, back to Salisbury, from Salisbury, trucked to the drill hall, told to hand in our weapons and ammunition, uh, go and get your pay, and go home. And we had the clue what the hell was going on. We thought, gee whiz, there you know, must, must be something going on, you know. That was um, a that was a long walk, uh, Wayne, because from Jambisi to exactly. the Jambisi exactly. to the Matetsi is uh, sixty two kilometers on its own. Yeah, I think it was it was close to about a hundred k's. I think oh. something like that. Um, anyway, it was only about uh, three days later I saw in the newspaper that it was um, Operation Nickel that we were on, and um, we were the only uh, TA works that were involved because the RLI and the RAR and in those days, I still had the police involved as well. And uh, we took some serious casualties. I think we probably lost about eight guys. But um, they did a good job, I think, out of that crowd that came across. I think only about five ended up in Botswana, 
where they were actually arrested, but uh, eliminated a lot of them and uh, a lot were captured, wounded and, and if, captured. If I'm not mistaken, they actually crossed west of Vic Falls and you guys were on the eastern side, weren't you? Yeah, that's right. We, mm. we, we were, and, and all the action took place south of the road, of, mm. of the main road. And of course, we were on the north side, you know, looking, we should have probably gone, gone west rather than go, go east. But they weren't sure where these guys were. Yeah. Right. Before we go on to the next step from that, Wayne, that's around about 67. Going back a few years, were, were you involved or do you remember guys being involved in the troubles up in the Congo? And um, I believe we sent people up there to rescue some of the, the refugees from that area. Yeah, the, the, the guys that reacted to that were uh, the, the chaps stationed in, in uh, northern Rhodesia, as it was. They would be the guys from 3rd Battalion and the and the 7th Battalion. Right. Uh, from us in southern Rhodesia, um, it was RLI and um, the SAS were up there as well. But yeah, the TA the TA guys aren't, um, you know, John Edmund, the, the, the singer-songwriter, yeah. he, he, he was on that. Uh, they were... They, patrolled up and down the, uh, the border there. So yeah, from us in Southern Asia, we, we, we didn't deploy at all. I remember as, uh, I was a six-year-old kid at that point, and I remember sitting on the lawn in, in Salisbury, watching the Dakotas coming over from, you know, carrying all the refugees. Um, yeah, there was... There I was can a, still see that, yeah. There was a huge exodus from there. Um, and obviously, you know, right, Northern Asia at the top there in uh, Katanga province. Yeah. And there's a lot of folk came, came through there. Um, yeah, there was. Uh, it wasn't. Um, that wasn't a very good scene. But uh, I think Rhodesians did a great job of looking after the the folk. You know, because they moved them right, the right way down to Salisbury. You know. Yeah. And then, from as I say, that was the op nickel was about the, the what we did as 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 in, in the OPA, and I was transferred back to um, transferred back to Bulawayo, um, and, and posted to 9th Battalion. And I should have actually, because I'd had four efficient years, I should have actually gone into the 6th Battalion. But the guys in the 6th Battalion didn't want to go to the 9th. That was the next step down, because they were still walking around with 303s. So they <laughs> said, no, no, hang on. We'd rather stay where we are, you know. So off you go to 9th Battalion. And um, it was it was quite... Uh, I, I ended, I'll tell you how I ended up in C Company, because I was in C Company for many years. Um, one of our uh, chaps that I worked with, um, he was the chief assize officer in, in Bulawayo, a chap by the name of Bucks Birkus. And when he heard that I was being transferred, he said, oh, that's our battalion, and you must come to see Kapi as our driver, you know. And uh, him and his mates, um, they were all naughty buggers, you know. They um, they loved going out. This, they always used to refer to it as a camp, you know. Um, anyway, we, we, I was just as I hadn't really long posted there when... Uh, we got called up to go and do a, um, a range classification. Um, so uh, when I got there, I said, said to the chap that was handing out the keys for the trucks, I said, can I, can I drive for C Company? He said, yeah, sure. And that's how I kind of ended up in C Company. You know? The next morning, uh, we had to do PT, which wasn't, wasn't, wasn't really PT. It was more sort of shuffling around. And, um, you know, I, I, I was kind of in like mid to late 20s then and, the guys there, they were all of us to be my father. You know? um, <laughs> but we'd been we'd been issued with uh, with FN, so uh, um, I didn't have to go back to 303s. Um, but we were, you know, on the on the range, there's 20 shooting positions, and you've got 20 guys in the butts. So to get through the company, was, um, we were up, sort of marching up and down, and we were doing basic foot drill, and then all of a sudden we. We were caught to a halt, and the, the guy directly in front of me, he just kept going. And he walked into the back of the chap, and he fell over and just lay there. And, and I looked, and I thought, hmm, this guy doesn't look, he's doesn't, he was white as a sheet, and, and it was like no sign of life. And of course, Sergeant Major came running over and said, what the hell's going on here? And I said, I think this guy is on his way out, you know. And he said, ah, you know, I said, well, it doesn't look good. Uh, anyway, he called a medic over, and it was typical of, of those years. Um, his medical bag was probably first of a war, and he opened it up, and I'm standing right next to him, and I look inside there, and it's, it's just, he's got all his first aid, um, sorry, first field dressings, all marked uh, 42, 43, a couple of dis packets of dispersion and some bandages, you know, and, and anyway, he, he said, yeah. I, I, need to get the, I need to get the ambulance, so he ran off and 
brought the ambulance across to me, put this guy on a stretcher and put him in the back. And he said, I'll take him off to hospital. And when he came, when the medic came back in the afternoon, I said, what, was, what happened? He said, no, nah, it was dead on arrival. So I was shame, poor guy, you know, that sort of put a damper on it. But wow. um, a couple of weeks later in the, the Bulwark Chronicle, um, it said then that because, because of that particular incident, they dropped the age. Um, the age at the time was 55 years, I think I'm correct in saying, before you went to a reserve holding unit. And they dropped that age down to 38. Wow. So you were in your, uh, once you reached 38, um, you went to a reserve holding unit. Um, Dad's army. Kind of, yeah, kind of. Kind of that, you know. It was, uh, even though, even though was, we lost all those guys, the, the companies were still quite big, you know. Company st strengths are normally around about 120, but we had 160, 180 guys, you know. So there was quite a quite a few bonds. Uh, and then, you know, from '68, uh, there'd been some incursions up up uh, north, and um, we were then tossed into start doing uh, proper border patrols. So we went from from '68 to '72. Uh, we did border patrols, and it was mainly from Matetsi across to sort of Milibizi, that sort of area, you know. Um, and the the RAR were basically doing doing most of those border patrols, and we, we basically just kind of leave them a company at a time, you know. And we, that's how we just rotated. So, yeah. you know, from nine or a company went in, then B, then C, and so on. Um, and then it, obviously we we as I said, we did um, these patrols until. 72, and of course, in 72, when, when they had all the attacks on, in um, St. Hilary, that um, we believe we were the first Manabele and company to go up there. But um, there were a lot. I think the I think the government sort of flooded that area with with troops, you know, to try and uh, show the show the flag, so to speak. Is that but when we, that that farmer de Borchgrave was murdered? Yes, was that the beginning yeah, of that operation? That was, yeah, but yeah. we we actually we were actually deployed to Sipalila, um and the uh, the RAR were there. <clears throat> and they had, it was the first time I'd seen uh, the word jock. They had a jock on top, on their, uh, um, on one of the tents. And all there was, there was there were two tents. One was a medic, medic tent and the other was like the ops room. And there were a couple of tents for the officers, but uh, that was it. Um, and we, our first deployment, we, you know, we said, what are we looking for? Who are we looking for? You know, and they just said, look, uh, this people are, are coming into this country by the hundreds, you know, and we've got to try and, and one of the things they said to us was that, look, you don't shoot anybody until you see a weapon. And um, of course, none of us had seen an AK up until that moment in time. And, um, you know, we'd, we'd obviously be lectured on them over the years, but uh, we hadn't seen them in the real. Um, so we went out and we, it was strange because we, that, that part's very hilly and there's, and there were quite some well-used paths there. And we saw these youngsters, you know, groups of four or five sort of walking around in the middle of nowhere and just wondering what these guys were up to. So we on one of the we got back from a, a, a patrol and we said to one of the officers, said, look, it's strange that these guys are all out there on their own. You know, they must be up to no good. So they said, Well, look, why don't you arrest some of these guys? And and the police got involved and they said, Look. A lot of these guys are porters, you know, and you need to check them that some of them are wearing two sets of clothes, and a lot of them you'll find they've got um, on their shoulders, they've got uh, uh, been carrying mines and equipment, and they would be, you'd be able to see these marks yeah. on that. On them. Yeah. So, yeah. We, we, had, so we, had, we apprehended, I think at the end of the day, at the end of that commitment, we apprehended about 80 of these guys, and they're all carrying, you know, um, and no way. Unfortunately, we couldn't speak. You know, we, some of us could speak. We had some very fluent Indibele speakers, but uh, no Shona speakers. You know, we were in a foreign country up there. Mm -hmm. And so the, were you still operating in sticks of five or had it changed to four for the helicopters? Yeah, we, we, we changed to four then. Uh, yeah. yeah. We changed back down to four. Um, look, there were choppers flying around, but we had, never with us. Um, but we had, that's what we had to do, learn to, learn to operate as a four-man stick. And we didn't... Again, we didn't have things like claymores and that sort of thing initially, uh, or grenades for that matter. We did. Uh, we went back the second time to uh, um, doing just patrolling, looking for these insurgents. Um, and our third trip also up to Sipalila, but we went down down uh, into the valley to uh, um, a camp called Gutsa, 
Um, and the company was split up somewhere went to Hoya, and we were in Gutsa. Um, and one of the problems we had there was uh, comms. Um, it was still early days in the war, and, and that part of the valley, uh, the comms were terrible. And we didn't really have any relay stations as such. L latterly, well, they, latterly there were relays all over the place. Um, but we, uh, we'd only ever done, well, I'd only ever done one relay when, on, on a border patrol where we had bad comms. And it was our boss who said to us, look, we need to get up at top of that mountain and see if we can get some comms. And so I ended up for about a week uh, on, on, a, on this mountain in the, in the valley. Um, and it worked. And um, we were told that there was a, a, a relay station um, that was being manned by, uh, it was originally by the RLI and then, then the, the RAR. And um, I'm not quite sure who the guys were that we had to relieve, but we weren't supposed to go up on the relay, but um, there was, uh, um, the RER were coming to relieve us and we were going home. Uh, but for some reason, um, they didn't pitch up. And uh, uh, we were all lined up, trucks were all lined up ready to go home, you know, and I'm seeing my, my RL ready to, to go. And um, our colonel came over and said, yeah, Wayne, we've got a problem, you know, you need to get up onto that, uh, there's a chopper coming here, grab a couple of guys and get up onto that onto that relay until we get, uh, because these guys have been redeployed somewhere else. Um, so we ended up going, instead of, not for a day, we were probably there for nearly, it's more like 10 days. Um, not having, we didn't, obviously, we didn't have 10 days worth of rations or water. And we took a couple of jerry cans with us, but of course, first jerry can we opened was, was all uh, rusted, you know. Um, and okay. the 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 guys that I had me were with actually drivers, and they weren't, you know, I'd done a, a, a single course, so I'd um, just got promoted to corporal, and uh, we had, I think it was, we had 28 stations there. Um, and uh, the first time I'd ever seen, there was a, a, um, a police a police radio there as well. Um, but I, I spoke to the police, and most of their messages were A and Q stuff, you know, or just idle chatter. Um, and I, we, so we had like 28 uh, call signs, and it was a bugger to keep up. And uh, and one guy with the Mac, he was, he was pretty switched on, but the other two guys uh, had the clue, you know. And it, what, hap what happened was we, the, the RER got into a couple of contacts, serious contacts, and they took a couple of casualties. And the, I, as I say, I was busy with, with one contact. And I said to the, the, one of the chap, I'll call his name now, but um, I said to him, please, please answer this chap here. And you he, he, he was a panic. You need to contact, contact, and try to get all of us. Anyway, this guy did what he was taught. You know, he, he wrote everything down on a message pad. And of course, this guy, yeah. <laughs> all he wanted to do was for us to relay back to his rear to tell her that he's in contact, he's got casualties, he, re he wanted more ammo, et cetera, et cetera. And, and of course, this guy's still writing out the message pad, you know. And um, I see, next time this thing, this guy comes on the on the radio again, um, this RAR officer, and I said, I said, just answer me. And he said to him, "Have you, have you, have you relayed my message?" And he said, "No, I'm busy doing it, you know." And this guy let rip at him, and wow. the language you ever heard. And wow. he, this poor lad, he looked at me, and he and he just dropped the handset, and he said, "Wait, well, I can't carry, I can't handle this. I'm sorry." Hmm. And I, I got onto the onto the guy, and I said, "Hang on a second. I said, I'm, I'll, I'll sort this out. Give me a couple of minutes, you know." Anyway, it, it all ended up. We managed to uh, get all the information back, and I was told him the chopper was coming back with a medicon, and they got extra ammo and what and what and what. And anyway, he came back later and said, "Look, thanks for thanks for all your help." But we we were we were busy like that for for seven days. It didn't stop, and it was just the two of us. And there was stuff going on at night as well. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Wayne, the radios in those days were crap in themselves, weren't they? The, yeah, A no, no, the they A60s? Were, yeah, the A60s, yeah. Yeah, they, terrible. They weren't, they weren't great. And as I say, in that part of the world there, you mm -hmm. know, um, there, were, there were features even higher than what we were. So, you know, if you were sitting on the other side of that feature, you, know, you battled against comms, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, when we, when we eventually got off, um, um, I'm not sure he was a half colonel or colonel, but uh, uh, Barnard. Um, from the RER, um, we got off the chopper, and I had a 
TR-48 out of one shot and my wife was slung and all my equipment. And then he said, he shall I, who's Corporal Stevenson? And I said, me, sir. And I thought, who's shit? I mean, you know, I <laughs> couldn't salute or anything like that, you know. But I dropped it and he put his hand out and he said, oh, well done, my boy. He said, you did a bloody great job, you know. And I said, oh, that's the first time an officer, the last time <laughs> an officer ever shook, shook my hand, you know. Um, yeah, so, uh, and, and, and then from... From then on, we, we, we were doing, we, uh, we moved on to different areas then, all, all in the northeast, um, but then more into tribal, tribal trust lands. And, um, and then we, you know, the company had hit a few landmines, but nothing serious. Um, and then on the one incident, I think I, I wanted to mention, um, we, the, 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 chap, the chap that used to be our, our mechanic in the, in the army terminology was the bluebell. Yeah, and he he we were kind of short of guys at the time, and and he went to the, one of the officers and said, "Listen, can I get? I need somebody to help me because, you know, he had to change springs on the front springs on the for every braking on the RLs and prop shafts and punctures and whatever." So anyway, he said, "Yeah, well, use my you know, he's the dog's body. He can, he'll help you, you know." So um, we ended up uh, we were headed uh, we went to battle camp at um, at Nkoma Barracks, and. Um, we when, we when we picked our vehicles up in Bulawayo, uh, the MTO there said to us, "Look, I'd or I've ordered tires for these trucks, but they they're like on the canvas; they haven't arrived yet." But I sent a signal up to uh, KG6, "Take these two vehicles in there, and they'll put new tires on for you," and so on. So that was our first task. So when we uh, when we got up to the battle camp, um, I was standing myself. We drove the, the trucks down to KG6, and by then we'd had three punctures as well on the back. Okay, okay, Tony. So we we went up to KG six, and uh, the sergeant major was waiting for us. And, and he said to us, "Look, um, I know exactly what needs to be done." Um, and he wanted up, up to, you know, I I'd, I'd actually left my rifle uh, in, inside the vehicle. And he looked inside and he said, "Where did you get these vehicles?" I said, "Yesterday, sir." And he said, "And they issued them like this." And I said, you know, "Why is there a problem?" And he said, no, "Why is there no armored seating?" And I said, well, we've driven these things like this for years. There's never, never been armored plating in there. And he said, well, I'm telling you now. And he went, he says, is the other one the same? I said, yes. And he went, had a look. And he said, right, I'm impounding both these vehicles. And he said, well, we can't. <laughs> We're being deployed. So yeah. he said, no, no, this, this is a problem, man. And he said, look, I'll get it fixed up for you. And he said, uh, we'll, we'll do it. We'll have it done in a day or so. So uh, they, that, that was fine. They took us back to uh, back to battle camp and... And in a couple of days' time, they delivered the vehicles there. The sad thing, of course, was that we were we were deployed to uh, uh, Matepa Tepa, which was a was a farming area, and right next door to this that dreaded um, Chueshi TTR. Um, and one this one particular night, anyway, it rained. It didn't stop bloody raining there for days. And and this one particular night, there was a, a farmhouse was attacked, and we were contacted and asked to uh, react. So they took it like a stick and a half. Um, and they took just one vehicle. And um, Eddie was driving a vehicle. And they, and of course, they were, they were told, you know, don't get, uh, we've had so many of these incidents where you're, you know, uh, going to a, a farm attack where they've actually put a, a mine in the, in, the, uh, in the road, you know. So uh, they got up to a, a cattle grid. And the, the officer on the back said, look, uh, the platoon commander said, listen, just we'll stop here, but just go over the grid. And as they went over the grid, they hit this mine with the right front wheel, which was right under Eddie. And unfortunately, Eddie wasn't in one of those mine protected, uh, the armor plated seat. And it uh, took his legs off. Um, and we, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a crazy evening. We had running around trying to, Trying to get him cares of act and Terrible. One, one thing or another, but we eventually got him into hospital and uh, um, they saved his life. Uh, but sadly, he lost lost both his legs, you know. Because, and and uh, myself and Stan had to go and recover the vehicle the next day. I mean, we went well the next morning, early early morning. Um, we were down there, and what they what these buggers had done is they'd they'd put the mine right against the concrete of the of the cattle grid, so. The explosion, instead of going out at 360s, 
sort of was like 180 and came up right underneath. And, and that was uh, that was why it was, as I say, he lost both his legs. So they just took him straight off, you know. Um, and, and, and that was a... It was a very, very sad day for us because that was the first sort of serious casualty that we had. You know, we had um, we had other incidents and in you know people lost their lives in the in the battalion, but this in uh, in our company this was like the first serious incident. Terrible. Um, Sorry, yeah. before before you go further forward, so Wayne, I was a little bit distracted there because my phone rang. But were you okay. actually present at that landmine that went off? No, I wasn't actually. Um, mm. we, Thank God, we were, it must have been horrible. Yeah, yeah, no, it was horrible. Um, um, we we were the back. Actually, when those guys left, we were the standby standby stick. Um, but that's how we worked. Uh, you know, there was a stick on standby, and they were the guys that went out. Um, we would be the next one. Um, but as I say, we we had to go down there. And um, the strangest thing was when I got there was, you know, Eddie's. Uh, he had he had. Um, like he bought a pro type shoes on, you know, and they were they were still sitting underneath the pedals. Good Lord. You know? And his legs had gone, you know. It was, mm. uh, it was really unbelievable. In uh in I think it was in seventy seventy five, we went to um we did a we did a a combined we combined with the RLI. I don't know which uh, commander it was, uh, but we were we were at um, at Mudzi and um, we we uh um, the the idea was for us to uh, take in all the locals out of the area, and it was just to go through and, and sweep through the areas and make sure there was no insurgents around or anything like that. And and if there was any dogs or strays or anything was shot, and and we just followed what the RLI did. You know, they just burnt all the grass and everything was just, when the wind was blowing towards the uh, Portuguese border. That was uh, the Mozambique border. Um, yeah, we just lit fires and, and we just burnt everything and shot anything in it. And it, it was it was the first time that, that our guys, when we came back, um, where the guys actually said, you know, it was actually quite enjoyable because we sort of, uh, we, we found we achieved something. You know, the, the fact that we were never, ever yeah. given a debrief. Um, and, and people always ask me, you know, why were, why were chaps leaving the country and that? And... I, I believe, uh, it's just my personal opinion, um, a lot of guys said to me, like, you know what, what are we doing out here? You know, we just live bait and we, we, no one tells us if we achieve anything. You know, if we pick up who we think are, are insurgents um, and we hand them over to SB, we never get told whether, yes, they were or yes, they, they weren't. Or, you yeah, know, there, was never, bad. there was never anything. And, and the, a lot of the guys said, you know what, I, I don't want to do this, you know, because I'm not achieving anything, you know. And so that particular time when we worked with R and I, uh, all the guys said, "Gee, was, uh, at least we knew we were doing something, you know, uh, for the cause." Yeah. Um, but then, straight after that, uh, I, um, my uh, my colonel said, um, "He'd like me to get into uh, uh, in, into the intelligence side." You know, we had what we called ice sergeants, which were um, basically putting stickers in the in the maps, you know, but uh, I went on an I course um, at Brady, um, which gave me promotion to sergeant, and um, uh, that just prior to uh, us going taking over Chakra um we did one other commitment, and uh, I, I mentioned this because we were talking about uh, bad radios. Um, this particular commitment, our colonel was there, and. Um, he said to me, he said, oh, you'd be pleased to see we don't have the A-60. We've got this new set. It's an A-30. And I, I'd never seen one of these, obviously. And he said, oh, the whole battalion's been issued with them. And he said, I believe they've only... And it was a small, lightweight thing. And I looked at it and I said, oh, okay. Um, anyway, he, he said to me, look, come with me. And you know, he was up and down. Uh, we were at the butts. And he was up and down uh, talking to the chaps. And one thing, and I was kind of his signaler. Um, and I said to him, sir, I said, these things are not good. I said, we, we can't even speak to guys in the butts. And he said, no, nah, they, you know, going to put up a dipole and things like that. And I said, you know, when you're patrolling, I said, you don't have time to do that sort of thing. You know, the enemy's watching you, you know. They, and I said, I'm unhappy with these. And anyway, we, we, we deployed with them and all our chaps complained. They said, no, nah, nothing, these are not good. Eh? And our A company was, was out um, at the time. And they had 
um, they had the A30s as well, and um, they were ambushed, and uh, it was terrible. They uh, we actually lost five guys. We we weren't in the same areas there, but we just heard through the through the comms that uh, <clears throat> we had three guys killed sort of instantly. Well, two is the one died at, uh, at the scene later, and then two guys eventually died in in hospital, and. Uh, we, they, they couldn't make comms. There was no comms. And um, what had actually happened was that the, 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 the two vehicles were, were driving together and the one took a, a wrong turning. They ended up on their own. That was the one that the, uh, the enemy decided to have a go at. Mm. And it was, a, it was actually a police um, a ground coverage chap that rocked up just after that. And um, he, he radioed through on, on his police radios uh, to say that the army were in trouble here, you know, and uh, by the time, as I say, by the time the choppers arrived, and that uh, our guys were not not in good condition, you know, and straight after that, all those radios were, were withdrawn from the, and we went back to the A60s again. So that was very tragic, you know, it really was. And that was in nine RR A Company, is that right, sir? Right? Nine R nine RR A Company, yeah, they got um, they got ambushed um, mm. and and badly badly shot up, um, mm. but. Uh, what? You know, uh, our C company, in, in fact, in, in the battalion, we've had, I think, half the fatalities. Uh, we, it was just a, it was just wherever C company was, we, you know. I mean, you know, we had we had chaps down at, um, at Villa Salazar. Mm -hmm. uh, and, a, and a mortar bomb landed on, right in the mortar pit. Wow. We had two of our C company guys in there, they were killed. Mm -hmm. um, and the other guys from C company were leaving, leaving Villa Salazar, coming back up to Rutenga. And they were ambushed, and and we lost uh, three guys there. I think it was another three guys there. That was a horrible area to operate in. Yeah, terrible, you know. <clears throat> anyway, so once I'd done my I course, um, we were on a on another. We, we ended up uh, we were deployed near near Fort Victoria, and um, our major at the time came to me and he said, uh, Nine or I have been tasked to take over Jock Rutenga from uh, Second Bat." So uh, I said, "Rah, okay, fine." And he said, "I want you to." Eat. I went down with. Uh, we had a, a signals. He was ex signals chap, but he was a, a captain, a Captain Henderson, I think his name was. And anyway, he and I jumped to the two five. We went down there. And we we took over uh, from from two, uh, Second Battalion, um, and Second Battalion moved down to Buffalo Range, and then we we took over the jock and ran the jock, and that's where my my I course came in because then I was in the jock. <clears throat> we didn't have an I. We initially we had an I O, but he was one of the platoon commanders, and I, I guess he was probably just put there because you know when the brass came round, you know who's your I O? You know there he was. <laughs> but, um, but he was. I say he was there one commitment. After that, I did everything. You know, I did the briefings and I um, did all the plotting and read all the read all the uh, sit reps and read everything. Everyone are up to speed with what was going on, and uh, so we were, we were there for probably um, well about two years, I think. Um, but and while we were there, uh, I'll just speak briefly about you know we had the the RDR were under command. Um, initially, they were on their own, but um, now the RDR was uh, coloured an Asian unit, um, and. We had the, the railways <clears throat> had built one of these one of their uh, load carrying trucks. They would put um, sleepers and sleeping uh, sleepers and sleep, sleeper wood and um, sandbags and that. And we had two 12, uh, 12 millimeter um, HMGs in each one. And we had a one of our sergeants from Niner. He he ran that, and they were referred to as nanny wagons and. And we asked where this word nanny came from. And apparently these colored guys were up. They got a, they used to take a couple of ladies of the night, you know, put them on this wagon and they went up, when the train went up towards Grello, they, they like serviced the lads on the way, you know. <laughs> and that's how they got, that's how they got their name. But they were quite effective because it's the same. They went, you know, there was always uh, two 12.7s on them. So they had some serious firepower, you know. Yeah. Uh, so the, um, and then, of course, we had uh, we had a couple of deaths there, uh, incidents at at Rutinga when I was there. Uh, the one one night, uh, um, the 
fire, the fire force at the time was um, um, RNI. And these, these youngsters were, um, Andrew Tenger, one of the farmers that built us, uh, well, they, they were, everyone referred to it as the mess, but it was a huge thatch uh, with great big mapani trees, you know, even growing, growing through the thatch. And these guys were climbing up these trees and, and they were practicing their, their parachute jumping, you know, from, from these trees. But um, I think things got, kind of got out of hand because next thing I see this guy coming off this tree and straight onto his bloody head. And uh, he was stone dead. Uh, he just lay there. He was done. Wow. And uh, that that put a damper on the on the evening. It, it yeah. wasn't very nice. It wasn't nice. We had a go. We luckily we had a um, at at the jock there. There was it wasn't a hospital, but there was quite a quite a good medical setup there. And uh, the guy ran up and, and pronounced him dead there. Mm -hmm. uh, just as I say, being acting the goat, you know. Terrible, eh? Um, and then we had a. We also had. Um, you know, the, the civilian convoy used to come from from Fort, Vic Fort Victoria down to uh, down to Bite Bridge and then back to Fort Victoria again. Yeah. And, and on one of the on the one occasion I was there, the the, the, the convoy was ambushed just right outside Ratinga. And the, the police guy on the on the gun on the back of the of the Mazda uh, took a bullet in the head. And um, so we were told to rush out there and see what we could do. And we brought out there and uh, we got the guy Back, brought him back, put him in, put him into the hospital there, and the um, the medic there was actually very good, um, Indian chap, um, and he fixed him up as best he could. And he said, "Look, we're going to get this guy to hospital," but there was obviously like an all these, you know, there was no no, no helicopters around, no, around. Eventually, managed to get out of a prawl, you know, the police reserve air wing, managed to get a guy to come. Well, it was a couple of hours later, and we had to take the seats out of his plane. To try and get the stretcher in. Um, anyway, they, they got him up to eventually got him to Fort Vic by late late afternoon, um, and uh, the doc, there was a doctor waiting there, and he had a look at him and says, "There's not much I can do for this guy. Going to get him up to Arari and or Salisbury as it was." Um, and they flew him up to up to Salisbury, and um, I don't I, I believe he didn't make it, but I, I, that I can't be sure of. But uh, it was just so tragic that that sort of thing happened, you know. I think that's where the um, the focus from a medical point of view uh, on that first golden hour to get yes, people exactly. into hospital saved Correct. a lot of lives. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's why I refer back to that A Company attack uh, ambush. You know, I think those guys had had decent comms and got somebody there in a hurry. Uh, perhaps yeah. these guys are still be with us. You know. Yeah. Um, but it, uh, the the air force the air force guys at, at Rotenga left. Um, and I was quite pally with one of the armourers there, and he used to invite me across to their mess. You know, they had nice uh, cups and saucers and plates and knives and forks, proper, you know, um, kit um, and nice food. And uh, anyway, he, he said to me one day, he said, look, we, we're moving. Uh, and I said, all of you? And he said, yeah, the whole lot of us are going. And he said to me, look, until such time as we, we get, uh, get guys to come and pick up, because they, they had hundreds of drums of fuel there. And he said, until such time as we get some of our trucks to come and uplift the fuel, we're heading off to Shabani, and can you just keep an eye on it? And basically what, they, what, he, what he did was um, he'd, he'd pull out uh, drums from, from the batch and bring them out onto the airfield so that when the choppers came in, they could just land next to the, next to the drum and pump and go on, you see? Uh, and once they'd, once they'd opened up uh, the drum, they pumped out what they could. They would never reuse that fuel. You'd have to put the lid back on and roll it away as, and, and they come and shell away what's going and pick them up later on. And so I was there this, this particular day and the, the RAR Fire Force was there and um, the guys were already juiced up and they were ready to go. Um, siren went, guys jumped into the choppers and I went out there to make sure that the drums were all in their lines and so that when they come back to refuel, and I see this chopper coming back, and I thought, this is strange, he's only been gone a few minutes, you know. And he got there, and the, the, the gunner was waving to me, and I couldn't quite make out. And he was, like, saying, like he was on the phone, you know. Um, and I guessed he must, he was obviously spoken to somebody. And anyway, I, he called me over, and, and, and there was one of the RAR guys lying in the back, uh, dead. And he'd been shot within a few minutes of, you know, while I was wow. still 
moving drums, you know. It was yeah. uh, quite a shock, you know. And, Terrible, and, yeah. And they, they had obviously got through to the medics because the, the medic guys were coming up with the stretcher, you know. Mm. Um, but it was just ha happened. It was just like minutes, you know. Just, yeah. It was crazy, you know. I believe, but, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, having uh, read books uh, from like Peter, Peter Bauer and all that, uh, I think I'm correct in saying that, that the Rhodesians developed their own pumping system to get uh, fuel into the choppers. Yes, uh, that's right. I seem to remember that, uh, all these innovations. Uh, yeah. how, how many litres of that drum did, did a chopper take? Jeez, I, I don't know. You'd have to speak to the chopper guys. But, uh, <laughs> I think it just, you know, they, uh, you know, if they were close to fuel, they would make sure they were always fueled up, you know, because uh, yeah. that would give them the, the range, you know. But it would uh, take the whole oh, the, whole drum, I guess, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would take. I guess it would take the drum. Yeah, mm. but as I say, I know from from times before whether they they've just pumped out say half a drum and they mm. would never use that again. They just tell you take that thing away, you know. Wow. Um, and the, and then the one the one after you know again I had to go out and also you know part of the sit rep you've got to give uh, your fuel status as well, you know how much F gas and how much F two. So of course the F four not being there. That was the job that was passed on to me. And I was out there, um, and again, moving the drums so they're in line for the helicopters. And I heard this roar, and I'm thinking, what the hell's going on? And I look down the runway, and all it was just black with helicopters. It was just black. And these helicopters came down the runway, and they, they stopped at the hover. And the, the one in the front just landed right next to me. And the guy was waving across like that, and he actually jumped out, and he came across to me, and he said, and they had, they had uh, Rhodesian camo on, but I, I could see these not, these these weren't Rhodesian boys. You know, that, but I'm trying to count yeah. these helicopters. And he's once, he's talking to me. And he says to me, "Is this is this Rutenga? And I said, "Yes." He said, "Is Shabari over there?" And I said, "Yes." And he said, "Good, thank you." And got back in the chopper, took off, and all these. And I'm trying to count them. And there must have been, I, I guess, 20-odd, as many as that. Maybe maybe even more, maybe 30. Were, they, count. All, were they all Alouettes or any PMS? Or? No, all Alouettes. All wow, Alouettes. South Africans for sure. Yeah, and I, and I guess that was probably, they were going up, uh, you know, when they did that big external. I think yes. that was On these the were the guys. But yeah. it was quite a sight to see these guys just, you know, hovering, hovering over the... Wow. Over the airfield, you know, pretty wow. Of them. Pity you didn't have a camera with you. No, no unfortunately. Yeah. Um, anyway, the, uh, shortly after that, um, when the Air Force moved out, um, Jock Rutenga was, was put, put down as a, a sub jock. And then we moved across to Shabani, um, and Shabani was uh, Jock Shabani then. Um, and I, I, I did a couple of commitments at, at um, Shabani. And then they downgraded that to uh, a sub jock. Uh, by then, the two RAR had, had established themselves in Fort Vic. So it was pointless having a place down at Chibani, you know. Um, so what 9RR did, um, they had a unit called um, Tech HQ Mobile, which was, um, sorry, um, there was, I, dr I drove the major around. We had an MAG on the 25. And then we had a, we had a stores truck with us. We had, um, a 106 uh, on the 25 with a trailer, and we had um, a section of mortars uh, with their trailer on a 25, and um, a, a map with the mine, mine and ambush protected uh, map uh, with the reaction stick in. And our job was to go to where all the hot points were. The first place we went to was the falls, because you know they were expecting these incursions coming across to the falls, and they, they wanted the 106 and the, and the mortars there, and that was our job. Um, and then we were, we, we were like swanning around the country because there was incursions coming down uh, Cherenzi way. So we, we'd head off from the, from the falls all the way down, down to Cherenzi. By the time you got there, it was, no, no, move on. Um, so we, we did that for a, for a while. And uh, uh, when I went to Shibani again, um, we, um, a lot of people have heard of um, Andre Dennison. He was the command, uh, company commander of A Company to RAR. Yeah. Um, and he he was coming to us for some reason, I don't know why, at, at Shabani. And they ambushed him on, on the main road there. And he came roaring into the thing and he said, Reaction stick, follow me. You know, and he was and he had a um, he had one of those kudus, you know, those 
yeah. on a, on a uh, Land Rover chassis, you know? Yes. Um, so we jumped into our map, either two five, and we, we followed him and we got to where he was ambushed. And um, it was it was great working with him because he was just, he was such a, he was an eager guy, you know, and, and for an officer, you know, he was out at the front end saying, come on guys, they pick up his tracks and whatever, you know. But by the time we'd, you know, we'd, we'd got to the tracks, uh, they, oh, the cattle had been through there and, and it was getting dark and he just said, ah, you know. Yeah. One up on them, you know, but uh, um, we're going to follow up. Tragic, tragic loss when he was killed, eh? Hey? Um, yes, yeah, yeah, he was accidentally killed. Accidentally uh, as well. Accidentally, yeah, in, in, um, that was at, at, at the hotel at, uh, um, at, at Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe mm. Ruins. Um, and then one of the other things we, we did, at, uh, um, which I think might be of interest to folk, uh, Nine and I were tasked to, to put up, uh, set up a, a motorcycle unit. Um, because the, um, the SAA Boeing's re pilots reported being shot at on, on about three different occasions, and they actually stopped flying into the Vic Falls, SAA that was, um, and they were, they were convinced that there was a Australia gang around there somewhere. Um, and we, as you know, with that, with that uh, sand and that there, that was ideal place for the, for the bikes. Uh, and so what these guys did was every time an Air Rhodesia uh, Viscount was coming in. They would, before the they knew when the when the when the fight was coming in, they would do a, a three sixty around and check for tracks. And, and they did a they did a um, what do they call it? A, they'd haul tires around the perimeter so that you could pick up if any animals or two legged ones had come across there. You know, um, so that was quite um, and, and that was part of when we were tech HQ. We, we used to always call in and see these guys and. Um, but the Grey the Grey Scouts actually uh, were the ones. The Grey Scouts were there as well. And they actually found the firing place um, and they picked up uh, what was left of the of the Australia. And th and they were saying then that the reason that they moved was something to do with because the land was so flat there. You they needed to be up somewhat higher. Mm. Uh, something to do with the trajectory of the of yeah. the rocket. Whatever. So that's why they moved. They moved across to. Uh, across to Kariba way. But yeah. um, okay. I, I was um, sorry to interrupt there, and I was no, no. I was actually based at uh, Big Falls Airport for about two weeks with my platoon and uh, we were put there to guard all the civilian aircraft at night as well as looking after the runway during the day. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah. And um, I think one of the talks has covered this Australia thing. I think it was Don Price's talk. But it's yes, uh, probably, yeah. Yeah, well worth looking into. Yeah, it has been has been spoken about. I know that. As I say, um, uh, there was the Grey Scouts that actually find the, the actual firing yeah. place, you know. Um, and then, of course, we were uh, we were now going into um, that was like seventy nine, and we're going into eighty. And my my last commitment was back to Rotinga, uh, where we were supposed to be all geared up to go and take out. Uh, um, these local, this local lot down the road from us, uh, in some, you know, they had those various camps. They got all those insurgents together, yeah. And and of course, the, the order never came, so uh, we we sort of went back to Borea with the tails between our legs, you know. Um, and and that was kind of uh, that was for, for us was sort of like the end of the war, and we didn't know what was going on. And and I mean, we spoke to officers and said, you know. Uh, by then, RLI had their final parade, and and we got all these rumours about uh, uh, we're going to be formed as a two six nine battalion because you know we had a lot of AS working with us, uh, latterly, and uh, they, uh, and it was just nobody knew what the hell was going on, and we were quite frustrated, and we thought, well, you know, what we wanted to do was to hand our kitchen and get it, you know, and they said, no, you still uh, you're still on strength, you know. Um, and that just went on and on and on and on and until 1981. And in 1981, you know, in 80, we had, there was a bit of a skirmish in the, in the western, sub, uh, western suburbs, which is the, the native locations. Um, and there were skirmishes going on there forever, you know. And uh, in 81, um, a friend of mine who was, who was actually a major in the in Nainara, he, he invited me down to his uh, family uh, farm. They, they had some nice bass dams down there. And he, and he imported a, a film from from, uh, from the states, you know, on bass fishing. And uh, so I went I went round to OEMs. We watched this film. We had a couple of drinks that, and 
And on my way home, you know, I could see all the traces of that the bangs and, you know, from coming from the western suburbs. And I thought, hmm, natives are restless tonight, you know. And half past five that morning, next morning, this Dudley phones me up and he says, hey, Wayne, the Borough has been invaded, you know. And he said, you've got to get down to Brady, you know, we're in big trouble here, you know. And, oh. Anyway, so I grabbed all my kit um, off to Brady. And as I'm driving into the barracks, I see his, um, one of the tow trucks pulling a, um, what was it, a, a BTR, 152. Yeah. You know, those yeah. um, Russian uh, yeah. armored personnel carrier things. BTR, ATO, um, right on. yeah. And they were there. So I, I followed him down because I knew we'd probably end up at the 2nd Battalion if they were sort of the active battalion as such. And I just followed these guys down and and, uh, and I got out and there were, there were two others there. And I must tell you, the guy that shot those, it was shot, you know, they had a, um, an Eland, um, Eland armored car up on the top of the, of the of, on the main road. And these guys were coming towards them. And then, I don't know if you know on that, on that uh, BTR that, there's there's two windows separate and there's a there's a um, a metal strip in the centre. Yeah. Every round every round went right through the, the centre of that between those two. Wow. It was deadly accurate. And of course in the back it just smoked everything. There was nothing left in there. Uh, and the one that was on the driver's seat, all there was was a bit of underpants, you know, yeah. left. They just a bit shredded them. But it was it was chaos because nobody knew what was going on. And there was a there was an officer who was saying he was saying right. Who's from the RLI? And hands went up. And who's this? And hands went up. And, and where are you from? I'm from Boat Squadron. And he's trying to get people together, I guess. Um, yeah. And a, and a friend of mine who was in Six Bat, ex RLI guy, he said to me, Wayne, come with me. We're going out to Essexvale to the battle camp there, where the Zipra were, were based. Um, and that's where those armored personnel carriers had come from. So I said to him, right, fine, you know. Anyway, I, I was then told to go and get a go and get a weapon. And so I went and pick, picked up uh, FN and rounds and one thing and another. And uh, uh, I, I saw I saw a Bob and I said to him, what's happening, Bob? And he said, he said, I've asked these guys for MAGs. He said, I want I want eight MAGs. And he said, they're not issuing us, any of us with an MAG. He said, only rifles. So he said, you know what? I'm not going out to that battle camp there with, without MAGs. And he said, you know, we didn't have any rocket launchers, mortars, nothing. So he said, it was MAGs and FNs, nothing. And they said, no, no images. So I ended up, uh, we had an officer who uh, remained unnamed, he, uh, nine or odd, and he said to me, um, you're a driver, he said, uh, we're going to enter Bonnie. Uh, and I knew enter Bonnie, that's where all the trouble was, you know. So I, I knew that I knew the Western suburbs well because I'd, I'd worked there over the years. But I, enter Bonnie was a new township, and I said, no, I don't know where enter Bonnie is. Um, I said, but I can take you anywhere else. And he said, no, no, we have to go to enter Bonnie. Uh, because the RER are in trouble. So I said, okay, fine. So this guy said, oh, I know where Interbody is. And so he said, well, you drive us there. No radios, one vehicle, all the things that you shouldn't do. Uh, so we jump on the back of this thing and we're going along. And he's talking to us. He's saying, look, don't shoot until we are shot at. And if you see looters, you can take them out. But no, nobody else uh, until we actually shot at. So we thought, okay, doesn't sound right to me. But anyway, we went along and, and of course, I was, we were in a map, luckily. And I was I was standing up here. The next thing you hear, you know, you know the bullets are going over your head. Clah, clah, yeah. geez, down. And then they ping, ping on the side. And of course, all the guys closed the you know, little, little holes there. Close all those up. And we're taking rounds. You see, and I said, what's happening? And he said, ah, nah, nah. anyway, he's, those that like disappeared, he was driving along again and, I'm standing up looking down on the left hand side because on the right it was kind of built up. But on the left hand, there was a wide open field. And I could see four of these tours walking across, two carrying um, RPGs over their shoulder. Another, one with a, one had an uh, RPG, another had an AK. And with that close, the guy said, Can we take these guys out? And he said, No, 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 don't shoot, don't shoot. You know, we're trying to be making peace here. You know? We've got to get to the RAR. And anyway, these guys have disappeared. And then again, and I. There was a chap, and I, I, I don't, I didn't, I never saw this. So I, I can't confirm, but he was on the right hand side, and he he actually saw uh, someone fire a, an RPG at us, and it was at, at a distance, and it, it landed in the field, but it in front, but it didn't explode. It obviously didn't go off. Um, but then we started taking rounds again, you know, uh, ping ping on the side of the truck, and then 
And eventually we, we got, we stopped. The guy said, here we are. It was actually the municipal offices. Um, and I, I, I just said, well, <laughs> this is not where the, the fighting is, you know. And he said, well, I don't, I don't know where to go from here. Uh, so we, anyway, we decided, look, we need to get off and have a pee break. We were obviously in the wrong place uh, and having no comms with anybody. We were kind of stuck there, you know, and uh, we all de bust to have a pee. And I walked around the, the corner and, and I just saw some movement. And and there were two youngsters, uh, one with a shouldered uh, AK and one with a shouldered um, RPG. And he looked at me and I could see he was scared as hell. And I wasn't sure whether I should shoot the guy or what I should do, you know. And they, they just turned around and slowly walked away. You know? And the other guys came around and said, what's going on? I said, no, you got these guys are just there, you know. They weren't causing any. I said, look, if they had tried anything, he obviously would have, would have pulled them, you know. But it was uh, it was just the, how, how unreal this whole situation was, you know. You had those yeah. that were, were on sides and the guys that were off sides, you know. Um, so uh, getting back into the vehicle and uh, we got a few more ping-pings and some bloody rounds over the top. And I said to, the, to the, the, the officer, I said, listen, I said, to be honest, I would rather be sitting at home uh, looking after my family. Uh, they'd be sitting here getting shot at and not being able to shoot back, you know? Mm, yeah. Um, and all the guys on the, on the back of the vehicle said, yeah, no, true. Um, so we ended up, I mean, it was strange. It was not much to do with the military, but we ended up um, at the scout hall, which was right, was right opposite um, um, Hamilton High School. And we were told we'd get an overnight there and we turned back to, if nothing happened during the night, we were turning back to Brady Barracks the following day. Um, anyway, so we had to do guard duty and I sort of pulled a short straw and I was like, uh, I think from Opera Street, off past four, something like that. And it, it, about, it was two of us on guard and, and I, I was looking across at the, at, at the open fields of the school and I saw a light come on. And I said to the guy, do you see that? And he said, yes. And I, was, and I could see a somebody walking in a shadow. And I said, there's somebody, somebody's broken into the school, you know? So I said, look, don't call, because we, we're thinking about looters and, you know, so he went to call the officer and uh, it took forever. And anyway, I, I decided to go across and then investigate. So I went across the, the light went out and I, I knew that because we were, I was on the PTA and so I knew that was where the booze was kept and we used to have our meetings up there. So. I see this guy coming down the stairs with this box, cardboard box, and I, I picked up my gal said to him, stop and drop. And he, he dropped the <laughs> he dropped the box. And I thought, you know, I, I, I can't kill a guy for for you know he was a young colored guy. But I thought I'll I'll take a leg off or something, you know, like, bam. <laughs> and it he went right between his legs, but on the steps. And I I think he must have had a change of underwear because uh, that was pretty close, you know. <laughs> um, anyway, the, the following day, the police arrived and they actually caught the bugger, you know. Uh, they had him up for theft. And um, and that that actually was the last time I fired a shot in anger. You know, that was that yeah. was it. And we went back to Brady, um, handed in our weapons. There was no debrief or anything like that. Thank you very much. Nothing, no pay, bugger all. Um, and I, I eventually said to my friend Dudley, I said, hey, have you ever called me up again? I said, unless it's an official thing, you don't, you don't come to see me. I said, uh, the days of being shot at are over for me, you know. Um, but the, the sad thing was, I mean, we were still, right into 1982, we still had all our kit. Um, we were still on strength and uh, we never had a final parade. Um, and then there was, there was an incident where, where somebody, uh, some CIO raided someone's house and found camouflage kit and something else that he shouldn't have had because he had, didn't have a military commitment. And then the next thing was we were told, everybody who's got any military equipment, go down to Brady and hand all your kit in. And and that was what I, that's what we all did. We just took all our kit, whatever we had, webbing and whatever, and just dumped it, you know. And uh, there was nothing, there was no, no receipts or anything like that. And I was quite glad because my, the stuff that I'd, I'd, I'd been issued with 18 years before, often would be wouldn't a wouldn't fit me, and I don't think I even had it. You know, it was things like socks and underrods and things like that. So that yeah, that was kind of the end of uh, end end of my time in the in the TA. You know, it was 1982. Wayne, there are quite a few questions that have popped into my head about that. Into yeah, sure. Thing. Go, go ahead. Um, first of all, um, 
what armoured vehicles were you driving in? Were they the crocodiles or what were you in? First of all, we had, um, in Sigma Daniel, we had, we had uh, Tim's trainers. And we actually just got rid of the Chevs, the four-wheel drive Chevs, which was Second World War vintage. Hmm. Um, then, then the RLs, the RL came in, uh, the Bedford RL. Uh, there were two models, the RL and the RM. We had mainly had uh, the RL, uh, four-wheel drive. Um, not in any way mind protected. Uh, they they had tried what they what they had done was was quite a clever idea. They put they put water in the in the tires. Um, so they're eleven hundred twenty tire, a huge tire, filled it up with water. And the idea was, you know, the Bedfords were actually petrol driven, mm. and there was always a there was always a, uh, a worry about detonating a landmine and the thing catching fire as well. Mm. Um, and and the water did two things: it suppressed fire. And it also took some of the blast. Um, and we, I know we've hit some mines where it basically just blows the wheel off and, and, and buggers up the, the, the drum in it. Um, and others like in, in Eddie's, Eddie's instance where uh, there was some severe damage to the, to the vehicle, you know? Okay. Yeah, Tony, the, the, the vehicles, the, the vehicle that we had when we went to uh, into Barney was a, a map uh, which stood for mine and ambush protected. So, um, they were pretty good because you had you had armor at, at angles up, um, and little uh, little slides you could open up and put your weapon through. Was that a Nissan? Fire through, fire through the holes. Yeah, they're a Nissan. On, on, on Nissan. Yeah. yeah, so that's a map. crocodile. Yeah. Um, the other question I wanted to ask you is um, how many, uh, I know the RAR RA, RA were involved in there, but how many white guys actually went in in the vehicles that you were talking about? Um, on on our uh, into Bonnie. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess on our vehicle it was probably about twenty, about twenty of us. Yeah. Twenty 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 two something like that. But yeah. you know there were other vehicles deployed as well. Um, and and as I said there was no debrief afterwards. So I mean I, I, I never knew what happened to the vehicles that were supposed to go down to the battle camp because mm. that was that was the problem. And they deployed some of the vehicles in and around sort of on the on the edge of the western suburbs. Um, and, and town itself, you know. Um, but yeah, you know, as I say, with no communication, no, no nothing. I, no, I'm no, no. absolutely amazed that um, that was 1981, a year and a half after the war had ended. Yeah, uh, I was absolute. I'm absolutely amazed that any white guy would even put on a uniform and get involved in that. Uh, what, well, what what was your sort of mindset at the time? Well, the the, the fact was that we we, we were never uh, demobbed. Mm. You know, we were still on strength wow. um, right up until 82 when we mm. went down. I, I actually asked the chap, uh, I said, I want, a, I want a signature for this stuff, you know, mm. and sign me off, you know. Yeah. They, they, they said, just go, you know. So I just go. So know, that, that was uh, obviously the adjutants and the base captains and all that were all African Guys belong yeah, well, to, to Zanga yeah, or Zipra. You see, um, um, if, if you look at the, 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 the TA setup, the, there was a lot of civilians in uh, what they what they refer to as nine hour on rear, would be the officers at there. They would you would have a, a couple of ladies in the office and a couple of um, clerks and that sort of thing. Mm. But you know, when when the war came about, um, everything just sort of closed down. There was, yeah. there was no disbandment as such. Mm. It was just close the doors and we'll see what happens. Which was terrible. I, I asked many, uh, as I say, this friend of mine, Daddy, I mean, he was a major. Uh, he was acting major. And, and he said to me, I said, what's going on? And he said, I haven't a clue. He said, as far as we know, we're still on strength and we can be called up and what. And, and I was, as I say, when, uh, uh, when, I, when, I, when Dudley phoned me, I actually phoned, he said to me, try and get as many guys that you know that have military um, experience. And I said, well, um, Dick across the road, he's taking the hour run. The chap diagonally opposite me, he's sitting in, uh, in, uh, with a head, serious head injury in uh, what's the rehabilitation place in the East, uh, Sanger Lodge. Yeah. And my other friend across the road, he was on holiday. He, he was in Intef. So uh, the only so other chap... That, only other this chap was... Something, sorry to interrupt you because we're going to have to wind up now. Uh, is this something that Dudley sort of sucked out of his own thumb or was he called up by? I, I don't know who called him up. Um, I haven't a clue. Um, somebody must have said we need to get 
uh, gang together. But exactly mm. who? I never. I, to be honest, I never. I didn't see him at at, at Brady when I was there. Yeah. It was only some months after that I saw him, you know, mm. and and we didn't discuss it either. You know, it was just a case of well, that's what happened. <laughs> I just said to him, "Don't ever phone me again." I ain't, I ain't going. But yeah. I think most of us thought that, uh, you know, we need if we if we nice to go there, um, you know, we. I think it could if it wasn't for those armored cars, mm. I think we could have been in a bit of trouble, eh? Because uh, yeah, you know, when those things come chundling down the road and you've got nothing to take them on with. Mm. Um, yeah, it could could have been nasty, you know. Could have a lot of lot of injuries, you know. In hindsight, we should have joined Zipra, hey? Well, you know the uh, the RAR don't get uh, much much praise for it, but if it wasn't for the RAR, um, I reckon Bulaya could have been overrun. I, I, those guys did a bloody good job. I mean, they went down there and they just took on anybody that um, I think they called it the Alamo. You know, they were surrounded by all sorts. Everybody having to go at each other, you know. I mean, uh, politi you. politically, we should have got, got the RAR and taken all the white guys and gone and joined Zipra to, to get rid of Zendler. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's politics for you. As I say, you know, it was, it was such a mess up that, um, I mean, like, as I say, with us and the TA, we hadn't a clue what was going on. You know, at least the, the regular guys had their final parades and got their money and moved yeah. on, you know. And we, we were, like, stuck there, you know, like... Uh, because the Zimbabwean National Army at that point was terribly weak. Mugabe was dependent on the RAR. And yeah, they, I, well, reckon if, I reckon if the RAR and, and, the, and the white guys had joined with uh, Zipra, uh, that would have been the end of Mugabe. Yeah, well, that was... Could you know, never um, happen. Uh, Tonga Gara was one of those that, uh, that stood out. Um, he kind of knew that he, he needed the European. Yeah. And, and he, he was... Um, I think he would have probably made peace with uh, in Como and uh, mm. things would have been a little different. But, yeah. you know, it's like all these, as you know, all these guys that get bumped off these days mm. to the motor vehicle accident, you know. And and he was obviously uh, uh, the first with the prime target, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so, so anyway. um, sorry, we're going to have to end off now because it's okay, been no quite problem. a long time. But it's been a very interesting talk. And, and just in closing... Um, did you ever sit down and say to yourself, what the hell was it all for? Was it worth it? Uh, what were your feelings when it all just ended like yeah, that? Yeah, uh, um, I've heard a couple of you guys on here talking about... Uh, um, I, one thing, I, two things that stick out to me is, one is uh, I, you always hear guys sleeping with their eyes open, sleeping mm. with one eye open. And I, for many years, I mean, I've always been a light sleeper. Mm. And any little noise, and I was up and awake, you know, like a mm. like a night ache, you know. Um, <laughs> and the other thing, the other thing was, well, I think you mentioned it the other day. Um, I'd, I'd moved down to Johannesburg for some time before I returned to Zim, um, and I always carried my nine mil twenty four seven. And when I, whenever I went out uh, to dinner or anything like that, I always sat in the corner with my and my wife always said, "Why do you yes. sit with your back?" And I said, "Well, because yeah. I can see the, the enemy, you know." And Absolutely. It was, it was it was a strange thing, you know. When, when you guys <laughs> mentioned it the other day, I said, you know, I've been doing that for all I know. 50 years, you know. <laughs> I, I didn't uh, even was, realize it was um, an indication yeah, of that exactly. until I, I'd read it somewhere else. My, my wife picked it up and she yeah. said, why do you always do that? I, said, I guess it's because. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Wayne, it's, um, it's, um, it's been lovely talking to you. It really yeah, has nice, been an nice interesting to talk. talk. To and, uh, I hope John can stitch it all together with the problems if, we've if, had. But apart from that, it's uh, yeah. been a very good and talk. If, if, there's, if there's anything else in the future, uh, any questions or anything like that, always give me a shout. I'm, yeah. I'm always available. Eh? Good. Thanks very much, Wayne. Take care. Okay, eh? Thank you. Look after yourself. You too. Cheers now. Bye-bye.